Hey guys, welcome back to the show. My guest today is Nadine Artemis. Nadine is a beauty philosopher. She's an aromacologist. She is an author and the founder of Living Libations, which is a luxury line of organic, wildcrafted, non-GMO botanical serums, elixirs, and essential oils. Her products are not a word of a lie, uh, beyond, just amazing. But today we are talking about sun health. And in our previous episode, which was episode 90, we talked about holistic dental care. If you have any interest in keeping your mouth healthy without a lot of the toxic things that we're exposed to, you're going to want to check it, check out that episode. But in this episode, it's about sun health. And what we're talking about here is really how do we develop a better relationship with the sun? Because as we all know, we can't live without sun. We need it. And at the same time, if we're not responsible with the sun, we get into trouble. So it's a, it's a great conversation. She's got some great solutions, great advice. And um, yeah, it's let's just talk all about the sun. So if you're looking to reach Nadine, um, she you can go on her Instagram, livinglibations.com. I mean, living libations or um, on her website, livinglibations.com. They've got also an incredible newsletter. I learned so much from that newsletter. And uh, if you decide to go shopping, you can use discount code longevity and save yourself 10% off your purchase. So if you get value from this podcast, make sure that you share it with your friends and your networks. Make sure to leave us a review because that's what helps us to get seen. And we're just going to have a quick short note from one of our sponsors, and then you get to deep dive into Sun Health with Nadine Artemis. Enjoy the episode. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Nadine Artemis, it is such a pleasure to have you back today. I'm so excited about this conversation. <laughs> Always a pleasure to hang with you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, Nadine Artemis, we are going to talk about uh, one of your favorite topics, and it's absolutely one of my favorite topics today, and that is the sun. Um, and um you know, I probably will have said this in the introduction that I'll record later, but we're going to rattle some feathers, shake some feathers, or I don't know what the proper expression is. Maybe we'll soothe them somehow. <laughs> soothe them. But really, I think we're going to, in this conversation, challenge a lot of the um, established norms around the sun, whether it's good for us, whether it's bad for us, sun exposure. But, you know, guys, before you get all crazy, just there, are, there's a lot of nuance to this conversation. Um, so I just think it's important to hear us out. And, um, and hopefully, given that we're going into summer here, I mean, probably this podcast will come out, I'm hoping sometime in June, or maybe the beginning of July, at least in time for some summer. Um, I think that um, it'll be really great information for people to have. So Nadine, you've been on the podcast before. So guys, if you haven't listened to Nadine's episodes before, she we recorded a great episode on or holistic oral health a couple of months ago that got released. Um, so I'm going to save some time here and we're not going to go deep into Nadine's story. Um, Nadine is the quintessential biohacker. She is the founder. <laughs> and the chief creator at Living Libations, I think, uh, which is an internationally an incredible essential oils company. Um, but like I said, quintessential biohacker to the core. So Nadine, let's talk about sun, shall we? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about sun. Because I feel like, you know, we've definitely been, uh, you know, lobbied into a loss of sunlight, yet I feel like there's sort of this intrinsic intuitive uh, feeling like everybody knows they feel better when it's sunny out and when they get a little bit of sunshine. So I feel like there's that like sort of this knowledge that comes down of like, don't do that. And yet our bodies and brains and beauty are all like, I feel good in the sun. and I feel good after I've had some. So that's always like, that was sort of my journey too. Because, you know, when I, I remember being, you know, my mom always, you know, put on sunblock well, or the sunscreen, blah, blah, blah. And then at school, you know, we were always trying to find a way to like get some sunshine in. We'd put like tinfoil in our books and then like just, you know, pretend we were reading. 
<laughs> and, you know, roll down our uniform socks and, you know, try and get some sunshine in just because I knew it always made me feel better. And so I definitely in my twenties then sought to find out like, you know, what is the truth here? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think the tinfoil maybe just to be. Yeah, that was too much. Oh yeah. And tanning with the baby oil, not a good idea. Baby you oil. know, most of the listeners are probably too young to know about that. <laughs> anymore. Um, but definitely, you know, that what you, when you say that we feel better when we get sun, I remember, I mean, I, I get to sunny climates more often now in the winter time um, than I probably did as a kid growing up. But I remember many times going to, to a, a beach holiday in the middle of the winter and it's funny, like I would always feel like my inflammation would get, go down. I would almost feel mm-hmm. like I was lost a couple of pounds. And, and it's not like I was eating less or dieting or anything. It's just my, it's almost like my body was going, you know, and maybe it was a combination of the sun and the ocean and the grounding, like it was probably all of those things. But even as, you know, I would even notice like my libido would go up when I would, mm-hmm. like all of these things would happen. And, um, and, you know, we, you never really, and you're like, well, you know, I'm probably less stressed because I'm on vacation and there's definitely all of those things weigh in, but, um, but doing a little bit of digging around on the sun, what it actually does for us. I think maybe we'll start the conversation with that. Like what are the, the pluses of sun exposure? Um, and then mm-hmm. the negatives, and then we'll get into what does responsible sun exposure look like. Um, perfect. Perfect. Um, I think that, you know, talking about some of the, what the sun can do for us is really important conversation because to your point, and you make this point in your book, Renegade Beauty, you devote an entire chapter to the sun. Our society, we're at a point now where people are so terrified of sun exposure, like they're wearing sunglasses and hats and long sleeves and long pants. And I remember once saying to a woman, you know, like I try to get like 20 to 25 minutes of sun with no sunscreen on during the day. And she was horrified. <laughs> she was just she was like, oh, I never do such a thing. And I just remember looking at her going, yeah, I think you've gone a little bit too far on that on that front. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking. Let's talk about the sun. <laughs> well, I think what's important to know, again, like it's, I mean, we don't even have to know this. We can just feel it. I mean, the sun really is the capstone of our existence. It's, it's giving us life every day, life for the whole planet, right? We would not be living without the sun. And then if we really think about sort of our evolution, really around the turn of the century was where there was a big difference in like, uh, you know, so from the 1800s to the 1900s, there was a big movement toward urban life and creating cities. And I think that was one of the bigger changes in the last hundred years where we, you know, kind of our daily day-to-day living, even less outdoors yeah. in general, right? As things got more modernized, Mm-hmm. And uh, back then in 1902, you actually even have the Nobel Prize going to um, Dr. Feinzen for heliotherapy. So yeah. that's coming into the fold. And I think it's being studied then too, though, because again, people have sort of lost the sunlight and then these other diseases come up. So met much of our modern diseases can be traced to a lack of vi- vitamin D because it does so much for our bodies that that we know a lot about and I know that we're going to be learning about for like the next hundred years mm-hmm. um, as as the invisible invisible wavelengths of creation of sunbeams you know unfold like just tell us as we learn more and more about it and um, then in the 1920s you even have like a hot Dr. Auguste Rollier sets up these hospitals in Switzerland right. in Lausanne to for people to come from all over the world obviously mainly Europe to heal things like rickets, tuberculosis, wounds. And um, you can even see pictures of that online if you Google that. Dr. Auguste Rollier, you know, look up those and you can just see, you know, people healing. And it's so, it's so beautiful because it's like this hospital setting with huge verandas. All the beds are outside. And yeah. it's just like, oh, if that could be every hospital, right? That it's so cool. Yeah. And you've even got sort of like then 1940s, you even got Mademoiselle Gauchanel saying that like outfit is complete without a tan. 
And then 50s start rolling where we're just like, well, really from the 40s into the 50s where chemicals just really infiltrate our lives. And that was, you know, where sunscreen got more advanced. And, uh, and I feel like, and then, yeah, we're sort of like, that's sort of like where we're at now. Like we're sort of a bit hungover from those few decades and that information. So it really is sort of this capstone of our existence. And then, uh, you know, there's the visible and invisible light waves. Yeah. And where I think we can, you know, we'll talk the most to sort of the violet, which is the end, the tip, because it's like the color spectrum, right? It's just like a rainbow. So the base, the first color is red, orange, yellow, blue, I mean, sorry, green, blue, indigo, violet. And so the red, infrared, near infrared, that's red, and then, which is visible, visible and then the ultra, the ultraviolet, the violet rays, mm -hmm. which are the ones that will change melanin and then create a tan. So in our, in our, in Ontario, and let's, I, yeah, I can't remember where the cutoff is in the States, but probably the, about the middle of the States, you definitely, you know, you're okay in California, Texas, Arizona, but as we get to the middle and then above, we don't get, you know, ultraviolet rays from about November to about mid-February, generally speaking, depending on your, on your latitude. And, but in that time, we still have the sun and the red all the beautiful of the all the beautifulness from the red infrared which is still important so getting outside even in the winter is a great great thing yeah um so, yeah and there's two things here so we, why don't we talk about the red before we go into ultraviolet and the skin and melanin because we really want to celebrate red because that is a really neat thing we're all what's up i said we're all yeah infrared and red light devices right so yes and thank goodness we have those, especially for, you know, when, when it's winter here for us. The really neat thing about the red and what's uh, less known um, is how it relates to melatonin. So we're all very familiar with the nighttime uh, product. Hopefully we're familiar with that and production of melatonin, which is produced from the pineal gland. And then that's circulated through the blood system and it makes us sleepy. And what's important is to, you know, not be exposed to light sort of past, uh, you know, when sunset happens, because any, you know, you being exposed to light will reduce our pineal glands production of melatonin and could create less sleep, especially if that's like a, a daily habit for months and years. Um, but what, what is less known, and I think is really awesome, it's all to, st to know is that the power of the red light and just getting sun exposure or even so the infrared is in all things green all things alive so you know walking through central park walking through a forest so you can get the red without having being directly exposed to sunlight so you're not just there like sunbathing you're just outside you're in greenery you can get infrared that way and what's really important about that, and again, we used to live a lot outside. I think we're about 95% of our lifestyles indoors. So we're not getting that infrared unless we have like a red light bed and we can make up for it or like a red light device. So what's important about that is there's actually a daytime production of melatonin yeah. that doesn't circulate in the blood, but is in the cell. It's a cellular production mm -hmm. and it it's an antioxidant that's more powerful than glutathione. And this intracellular production acts like a coolant for the mitochondrial action of turning energy into, uh, you know, providing to the ATP. Wow. So with that reaction, right, there is the reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress. Even if you're healthy, that process just creates oxidative stress. And so the melatonin, it doesn't circulate in the blood, it's in the cell, so you're not getting sleepy in the daytime. And then it acts as this coolant for that process. Mm -hmm. And that is very important for the health of our mitochondria, because I think, I don't know, what I keep learning in the past decade is that it keeps going back to the health of the mitochondria, right? I just feel like all roads lead to that if we can have health in the mitochondria. So it's really important, um, you know, even forgetting about tan. And sunblock and all of that right now is like getting outside on sunny days 
um, direct or indirect light. And it's important to, to not wear sunglasses. Mm -hmm. Again, we need sunglasses, you know, times we want to look cool. <laughs> I'm just joking. You know, they're good headband, but also like, you know, for driving or whatever. So it's like, there are moments for it, but you don't want to be like, you know, getting all doing all your health and being like, I'm going outside for my health and then popping on sunglasses yeah. because light is very healing for the eyes. And I love uh, Dr. Jacob Lieberman's work for that. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he, he, I read his book, like, I think when I was 20, take off your glasses and see, which was phenomenal. And he has since written a lot about light. Um, so he's awesome. And he's got a lot, you can tell he's spent a lot of time in the sun because he's very wise. <laughs> you can tell he's been really getting down for a number of years on light and color. So I'm really thankful for his work. But there are other um, thing, things in the eyes, and I can't remember the proper scientific words, but they're cells. And they're, it's not about the vision and turning, you know, about seeing, but these cells send light into the suprachiasmatic nucleus mm -hmm. and help us regulate circadian rhythms. Yeah. So that's so important, right? Even before we talk about sunning, sunbathing for a tan is really tuning into the sun to get a grip on our rhythms, reignite our circadian rhythm. So being like, again, if you can, I mean, I, and again, this could be five, 10 minutes. If you're able to find the sunrise somewhere in that first hour, hour and a half of the day, you can look directly at the sun within that first hour. It's amazing for the eyes. Uh, and again, there's no ultraviolet at that time. And then, you know, but again, you can get five, 10 minutes in and then sometime around noon where you're getting seen and then, and then that's actually a really powerful time. And, and the shortest, like a, you can have a really powerful short window. Like you can have less time in the sun, more impact. What am I trying to say there? Like you can maximize your moment there in the sun um, because around that time, you know, a half hour outside really can almost give you your daily dose of vitamin D. So hope maybe you can have lunch outside or something like that but if you if you can be present at noon and see that sun and again when it, when it's daytime you want to be looking in the direction of the sun but not at the sun but right. still getting that healthy information because even dr august rollier back in the 1920s even though they didn't have as much scientific uh, analysis back then he was like if you have sunglasses on the effect the healing rays of the sun just aren't working. So we really do need our eyes like as part of the process, which I find interesting where we also have modern information that says that and sort of older information that says that. Um, and then if you can be present somehow for sunset time, right? And just, and again, it's not sunny every day. So it's not, you know, it's something you've kind of got to look at the weather and see when you can map that out. But if you can be there in those, you know, that sort of sunrise, noon, sunset, or even catch one of those, it just really starts to like shape your life. And, um, you know, you just sort of connecting to something yeah. that's outside ourselves and ourselves and is really, you know, a part of that cosmic engagement. And I, I feel, as you know, from my book, Renegade Beauty, I'm really saying like, what's going to revive us yeah. and restore us and rejuvenate us isn't another bottle of anything, another supplement, another thing. It's finding a way first, foundationally, to engage with the elements, you know, to be outside, to find fresh water or, you know, obviously have baths and showers is engaging with water, which is great, but getting that fresh air and you know, planting your feet on the earth sometimes. And I feel like the sun, obviously being one of the elements is such a big one. I, so I, I feel like that's, yes, how we can use sun sort of to guide us and get back into some kind of circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, it's so much of what you said resonates. Like I know that with clients who have trouble with sleeping, one of the first things that I talk to them about is getting outside first thing in the morning, it's, you know, I talk about it as getting information. It's, it's kind of how your brain gets oriented with the day. Yeah. It, this is in yeah. the brain about what time it is, where it is. It's going to impact because you start making that melatonin first thing in the morning. Um, like that, that's when your sleep in, in many ways, your sleep hygiene starts in the morning. But the other thing that I mm. talk to people about is it doesn't have to be full sun. Like even on a cloudy day, I mean, 
granted, we we've all seen those dark, dreary days where there's a little <laughs> of sun coming through. Even yeah. <laughs> somebody out there would say, no, actually, there's definitely some rays making it through. But even on an overcast yeah. day like we're having today, you're still going to get a lot of those information rays coming through the sun. Yes. Not to yeah. mention that I would guess that many people, and I've experienced this, you can get sunburned on a, on a cloudy day, big time. Absolutely. Yeah. So, we, yeah. So we can't, we can't dismiss, I think your point about getting outside in nature and frankly, for me, sunglasses are a thing of the past. I think I have air in my car on the off chance that I'm driving into a sunset at some point. And I literally, yeah. <laughs> it just, yeah. But I've saved thousands of dollars over the last 10 years. <laughs> Because I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I just kept losing them anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, I've literally had like the same pair of sunglasses like for twenty years, and they're hard to find. You know, they come out once a year or something when I'm driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I think great points about the light. Thank you. I, oh, I, also, and then just as a, just you made me think because the sunglasses and eyes, it's like really when we're when we can you know absorb more light. So e- even when you're seeing the sun rise and set, you may have to like cover an eye. Mm-hmm. And, and so you can really absorb it fully. But the more light we can absorb is it actually going to help with things like crow's feet because you don't want to be squinting with light. Oh, yeah, there's right? a- it's like we squ- like obviously there's moments or like, you know, the sun's blasting right at you. But like some people like just to walk out their door, it's like, whoa, even on a cloudy day because they've been at their computers. Mm-hmm. So we need our eyes to be able to handle light and you know, and, and be friendly with light. So it's great for the development of kids' eyes as well. So they gotta get outside. Yeah. Yeah. Little babies with sunglasses on. I mean, yeah, it's cute. Yeah. Um, and usually they're pretty poor quality on top of that, but, uh, which is another thing, right? Poor quality sunglasses, a lot like poor quality sunscreen, which we'll get into later, will end up doing more harm than good. So um, if you yes. are going to use sunglasses, making sure that they're the right kind. And if you're going to put small child, please <laughs> make sure you're going to have to spend the money, unfortunately, and maybe it would be better just not to. <laughs> so, okay. So let's move on. So definitely. So light during the day, this is the benefits of the red, the ultraviolet rays um, in setting circadian rhythm, helping the body to adapt to light. I've definitely spoken to people who've told me I can't be outside without sunglasses because it hurts my eyes. And so what you're saying in a case like that is to gradually build up your tolerance, but do it in that very beginning of the day and very end of the day when the rays are not going to be as challenging to your eyes. Yes. And then in the daytime, look in the direction of the sun. So not, but don't look at it, but don't, you know, because that will help your eyes as well. So just look, you know, somewhere towards it. So it's like there, you're not, so you don't have your back to it. Mm-hmm. That's going to help too. Right. Just let the light in. <laughs> let the sunshine in. Yeah. So yeah. really interesting stuff in the, in your chapter about, um, and I don't know if you're ready to jump to this yet, but sure, yeah. I mean, there's definitely the, the whole discussion around blue light, right? So, yeah. so and it's funny, I think of blue light sometimes as, poly um like uh omega-6 right omega-6 gets demonized blue light gets demonized but the truth is there's some beneficial blue light and there's some beneficial omega-6 fatty acids which we're actually going to get into that discussion later but for the blue light you know again you're going to get that blue spectrum during the day like around the high noon which is very different than the blue light you're getting from the artificial overhead lights in your office, especially the, the fluorescence um, and yes. coming in off your computer. So maybe we want to talk about the blue light just a little bit as well. Yeah, it's true. Like, yeah. And it's been, you know, there's ways you can use blue light for healing. And um, we actually will have this like um, mouth light coming out in uh, you know, maybe by the fall, it will have, you know, option for red light, blue light, and both lights. And the blue light, when you use it with the toothpaste, will help whiten it, will help whiten your teeth. The red lights are good for bacteria. So yeah. that'll be a fun little thing, right? Um, yeah, and, but get that blue light during the day, but we were never designed to really be, you know, staring at our little iPhones of blue light in the middle of the night, 
for sure that's going to disturb oh, yeah. circadian rhythms. And you know what, uh, when I redes if I have to redesign a place or a house, what I'm for sure going to be doing is adding a, a, a set of light or like a light switch that goes to red light so that at night we could just flip a switch and red light would come on. Um, but I've actually in these past few months even been trying to like, especially it's easier now because the, the light, it's light out till about nine o'clock, but yeah. really finishing with light and then like not leading light once it's dark out. Um, and you know, and if I have to, then I'll use my blue blockers or whatever. And I have my iPhone set at um, night shift yeah. 24 hours a day. Nice. And I think that's important too. And I've told a few people about that and they don't get headaches now in the day because even in the daytime, that is such, it's such a bright, strange light, mm -hmm. you know, when it's not on night shift and I just turn it off if I'm editing a photo or something so I can get that true color. But we want to, you know, you want to do that or you want to have like flux on your computer. We definitely want to, you know, take out blue light from our devices because I think we're on them a lot. And even in the daytime, I think it's good to filter that out. I agree. Now, don't have to worry about the blue light, you know, in your light bulbs and all of that during the day, that's totally fine. And then if you do have, you know, maybe you get like a night light, if the lights lower in your home and uh, you know, like a low lux, then that's good. Have that as a night light or something, but just keep it low. Um, and then also, you know, there are clocks or clocks, I don't know if they're clocks, they're light things that you can time. There's a dawn light that really will create gradual light in your room. And it yeah, really helps with seasonal affective disorder. And, uh, you know, it's a certain amount of lux, it, but it's very effective in like cheering people up. So if you get 15, 20 minutes of that a day, it really helps. And that could be, you know, what wakes you up in the morning and just stay near that for like 15, 20 minutes. It's very helpful. So we can really be using light is as our friend and to heal us. And I think when we work with it, we can, you know, rather than using things that are sort of in, impeding our health, there's so much we can do with light and sunlight that really help us get that deeper foundation. So yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And one thing about the nightlight is what I have is a, um, I have a little salt lamp nightlight. Oh, nice. What I've been looking for, and I haven't found it yet, I want to find a red bulb to put in there because your nightlight could be a red light. Like it doesn't have to, mm -hmm. have to be white. And it's, you know, it's, it, it sounds weird when you talk, tell people, but at the same time, like do the, do an experiment, use a red light as a nightlight. So when you go, if you have to go to the bathroom in the night and notice how much faster you fall back asleep, like no, notice oh, how yeah. worrying it yeah. to your eyes and to your system when you're exposed to red instead of that white light. Yeah, even if, if for some reason I wake up in the night and I have to check what time it is, I put my blue blockers on for that one second of thing. <laughs> Me too. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> for the blue blockers going. It on. helps. It totally does. Okay, so let's go back to vitamin. So the sun and D, like sun, skin, yes. vitamin D. Like yeah. vitamin D. And I think one of the ways to start this really is to talk about what does vitamin D do for our body? Like, it's so important. I mean, people think so of, important. I got to have vitamin D, especially over the last two years, you know, mm -hmm. all the noise and the mayhem, definitely the message that being vitamin D deficient was at the very least a negative if you did catch COVID, right? Like, I mean, having high vitamin D levels, we're going to protect you or not. Definitely being vitamin D deficient, there are a number of papers out there now that have shown that people who were. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, for that. Yes. And, and there are. Right? Yes. And there are thousands of studies that just show if you have sufficient vitamin D, like all these things happen, or you know what I mean? So, and I've, I've been really, you know, talking about vitamin D because of my research for over a decade. Like, I've really been thinking about D in many ways, but I've got to say like every year, it just seems like there's more and more reason to take it. And I really, even in the last three months, I've just learned even more how yeah. we just completely need to be sufficient in vitamin D on a daily basis or, you know, the shit starts to hit the fan, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and I, you think, know, cause a whole, yeah, even what some like, TMJ or bruxism, really root cause, most likely not sufficient in vitamin D. Really? Like, 
you, if you're vitamin D sufficient, your risk of breast cancer is slashed by 50%. Wow. That's like more than giving up alcohol. I think that's like about 15%. So I really feel like we probably could have margaritas and be in the sun. <laughs> Maybe that's the place to have the margarita. I think that's the plan, right? <laughs> Number one cause of juvenile diabetes is insufficient vitamin D in pregnant mama. So it's like the D story comes from everywhere. And uh, Ryan from True Diagnostics, who you've had on your podcast, yeah. um, he explained to me that being sufficient in vitamin D seems to also uh, affect the telomeres. And that if you're sufficient in vitamin D, it seems to add a, you know, an easy 18 months to your lifespan. Incredible. Or take off or make you like 18 months younger or something, something really good about 18 months. <laughs> I yeah. can't remember. I think it's adding to the lifespan. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I feel like it comes in from everywhere, our understanding of it. And so, you know, often that will be like, great, I'll just vitamin D supplements. And then I don't have to be in the sun because we're so afraid of the sun because we don't want to have wrinkles. So I think that's, that's the real crux of it. Yeah. But from what I've studied and what I'm looking at, it seems like our skin was completely designed to be exposed to the sun. We've got thousands of vitamin D receptors all over our body and they need to be brimming with vitamin D and vitamin D that is created when our skin connects with sunbeams is completely different than the supplemental fat soluble vitamin D, which is key. But when the, the sun and skin make a water soluble form of vitamin D that creates a very healthy and essential cholesterol sulfate, and so, and it's not even a vitamin, quite frankly, it's a hormone. Oh, yeah, it's literally a hormone. And so it really actually is, is creating like this internal lubrication that is so essential for the body to function. And then also when our skin is exposed as sun to sun, we're also creating things like our own antimicrobial peptides, catholicidins, catholicidins like LL37 are created from our time in the sun. Yeah. I know that you and your people are familiar with the LL37 peptide, yeah. which is great for many things, including gut healing. So we can also boost that because um, when we use that naturally with the sun too, that will help things like preventing things like cytokine storms in the body. When we don't have our vitamin D receptors filled with vitamin D, these things called bacterial lingons mm -hmm. can come in. To me, it's kind of like, you know, it felt like if somebody was going to rob a building, like all they'd have to do is like, just turn off that main switch. That's what these bacterial lingons do. If they get a grip into the vitamin D receptors, it's like they can just sort of shut down the whole immune system. And so it's really neat as I feel like now we have this sort of modern knowledge about the sun that is showing us why like a hundred years ago, Dr. Auguste Rollier was able to, you know, clear and heal diseases. Mm -hmm. And also being in the sun like that too also cleanses the blood. Yeah. And it's a fun, you know, so it's a fun way to be engaging with life in that manner. And um, it's funny because now we li we're living in a society that we spray on tans with like dimethyl, I forget what it's called, but it's a complete chemical. You know, we're trying to heal acne with things like benzoyl peroxide or eczema and all that. And all of that can be really cleared up in the sun or learning how to like engage with the sun properly so that we can build a healthy melanin base layer. And uh, we can't want to think of our bodies and our skin like uh, solar batteries sort of, right? And so we want to use the, the sun time. I mean, some people are lucky and there's always sun the closer they are to the equator. But you know, for me, especially in North America, we're you know, building up in the spring Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, and then you want to build it up so that by November, well, because it's getting less and less by October, November, and that you can kind of get some build up in that melanin layer to take you through the winter, although it never seems to last. So no. I always, you know, I'm always supplementing with it. But one of the really good things to do and to really get to know your D levels, because it isn't something that you can just check at the doctor and get that and then think your D level is going to be the same three months later or a year later. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that also then, you know, and then I don't like to depend on a doctor for that too, because in the sense that, you know, I just want to be like dependent and not worry about an appointment <clears throat> to know something about my body. And so I find what's really useful is the D Minder app. 
Yeah. It was created by a group of very passionate vitamin D doctors. And, you know, it'll take into account your longitude, your latitude, you put in your skin type. There's like a, uh, this Fitzpatrick measurement. So you just like, you know, if you're like sort of the redhead from Ireland yeah. or like Mediterranean man from Greece, there's like different, obviously different skin tones, which affects your vitamin D. So the deeper your skin color, the more vitamin D you're going to need. And also, um, if your weight is above average, yeah. then you will also need more vitamin D because uh, there's just more for it to penetrate and the body is just going to need more. So I think that's a good thing to know because maybe some people, you know, might be struggling as to why their vitamin D levels aren't higher, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So then you put it, yeah. So it takes your longitude and latitude into account. So it knows the strength of the sun. And for example, the D-Minder app, you know, let me know exactly when the sun, the, vitamin, the ultraviolet rays were coming back to our area in February. So that's when I start again, I'll just open my doors. You know, I have my, like a little uh, bean bag that I'll sit on. And then, um, yep. you know, there's five feet of snow all around me, but I've got the rays and it just feels so good to, but in February to connect with the sun again. And then I'm slowly but surely building up uh, you know, that base layer as the sun is getting stronger. And, you know, by July, I just got, you know, a good solid base layer um, that I can, you know, not be getting burnt with. And I've had so many families and, or just, you know, people that like an Australian family, I'm thinking about specifically right now, they did it, they started in their, in their spring. And then they were like, you know, not needing sunscreen by the summer because they built up that layer. Mm -hmm. And so, it, so when you're in, so you, you start your sun session with the D-Minder app when you're in the sun, you, you also say how much of your body is exposed. And then it will literally tell you how much vitamin D you're creating, how long you need to be in the sun. And generally it's like that vitamin D window is the right amount of time to be in the sun. I mean, that being said, maybe if you are that redheaded Irish person, you will need to work your way into that more slowly. Mm -hmm. but that it gives you that daily dose. So, you know, and then if you have a supplement, you can add that in uh, at any time. And so you have this running record of your vitamin D levels, which is awesome. You yeah. can either start at zero or, you know, I'm, although I'm sure everybody has a little tiny bit, or you can go to the doctor, that blood test, and then literally put in your results. Mm -hmm. And that, that way you're tracking and you know, because we really don't want to let vitamin D get insufficient because I think that it really does show from tests and studies that we've done this test virus and things before this even happened it really does show that once you dip in your vitamin d levels you're very susceptible to you know catching a cold catching a virus and it's like is there a cold and flu season or is there a sunlight vitamin D deficiency season? For sure, for sure. And I think, <laughs> yeah, I think with the, the vitamin D, is, it's such an interesting topic because even understanding your genetics gives you some indication. And I don't know if D-Minder um, actually takes that into account because, you know, as someone from Med of Mediterranean descent, I convert vitamin D much more slowly from sunlight than someone from maybe... Um, like a climate where there's less sun. So if yes, you I think in a way it does because it is asked either it's Patrick scale, yeah. which is take into account a bit of your territory. So I think as much as like an app can kind of have those nuances, I think it's pretty good. I think, the, and, and then the other thing that's interesting is that again, looking at genetics, I'm a person who doesn't clear activated vitamin D as quickly as the next person. So there's some kind of... Uh, mechanism built in there. And one thing for, for people to bear in mind is that what we're measuring when we're measuring um, blood levels, when your doctor's measuring your vitamin D levels, they're measuring the 25 OH, which is the inactive form of vitamin D. What they're not measuring is the active form of vitamin D in your body, which is the 125 OH. And in someone like me, with that genetic polymorphism, I really need to be measuring the 125 because I could be getting my 25 OH could be showing low, but my 125 might actually be quite high. And there yeah. is a degree of toxicity with vitamin D that we don't want to exceed. 
So I think it's really important for people to understand that. The, I mean, first of all, the vitamin, the D Minder app is fantastic because it's a really great place to start. But if you've ever looked at your genetics, then it can add a little extra nuance to the conversation. And maybe you're one of these people that needs to pay a little bit more attention to that back end of the pathway, because it's really when we're hearing D that we're making the cath 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 LL37. Felicitous. Yeah. <laughs> the, yes. the antimicrobial effects of vitamin D come into play, which is where, you know, people who are sitting there trying to make the connection between vitamin D and staying healthy and not getting the flu, whatever the flu may be, it's that pathway, it's that production of that antimicrobial element. But then the other big piece we were talking about before, and Dr. Rollier figured this out, is the children with rickets. So this is a bone disease. And what oh, yeah. so vitamin D is critical to bone health. Critical. Yes. And therefore teeth health, tooth health, whatever, because, because yeah. our teeth are bones, right? So also, uh, I talk about it in my book, but in it's like the spring, like March, for example, there is so many more diagnoses of disease and cavity. Yeah. Because again, most people have then been like three, four months without any vitamin D production. So mm -hmm. that's like just sort of showing you how essential it is for our health. I also feel, you know, what's good too is like that when you're with it in the sun and getting your vitamin D too, the absorption is different. So some people, if there's gut issues or absorption issues, this is a good way to, to balance that out. And I do just want to just hear if you really have like a, just such low, low levels, a good thing to kind of get the system going is to visit like a naturopath or a doctor, a functional medicine doctor that could give a vitamin D injection. Mm -hmm. um, because you want to make sure that that reserve in the kidneys is, is just sort of stocked up. Yeah. So that could be, you know, if you're finding, you know, cause just taking that 5,000 IU a day might not sort of give you that edge where you got to get that baseline up. Right. And also the vitamin D toxicity is interesting, but it does seem like it, it, it was from a very old test that has sort of been de debunked. Yeah. So it does seem, you know, general, you know, the recommendations also to be able to, you can be a bit higher than what was recommended, like easily 5,000 to 10,000 IU a day seems to be very respectable because also what you can generate, you know, being in the sun is quite high and the body seems to denature what it doesn't need. Yeah. So it, it, you know, so that's good too. Like it is, I think, hard to get too, too much. Mm -hmm. I think in our current situation, obviously if you're by the equator or something, that's a different story. Sure. So, okay. So let's talk because at this point, you know, the audience is hanging on a thread and they're like, okay, you're they're not with us because they're like, yeah, but what about wrinkles and aging and sunspots and all that horrible stuff? So I do want to recap that one of the, one of the things we're talking about here is number one, we're building a sun callus. So we're exposing our skin to sun in the very early hours of the day and in much later hours of the day, like closer to sunset. So around sunrise, around sunset, and in the middle of the day, it's gonna be a very short period of time, like maybe 20 minutes to half an hour. Well, yeah, and then once, I think in the beginning, but you can have it longer once you've built up your, your melanin and all that. And the, the difference is when I was growing up, you know, my mom was always like, don't go in the sun from like 10 till three or something. But really, you want to, what's good is the morning sun up until solar noon. Okay. So right now, solar noon for us in Ontario is like closer to 1.30. Mm -hmm. It's going to get closer to 1 as we get into the summer. And um, so I love that morning sun. If I want to have like a longer time in the sun, for me, like, you know, sort of that 9 to noon, because in that 9 to 10 is not a lot of D production. Like right now. I was, I put on my D minder app like nine, nine to 9.30 right now. So it's like May. And that was only like 5% of my vitamin D production for the day, even though it was a beautiful, felt very, it felt very warm, but it was, it was weak on the D. So if I really was like, you know, needed to, can't spend all morning out in the sun, then I would want to do like 12.30 to one right now to really get that, to have that half hour you know, deliver the D for the day. So it's interesting. So that's what the fun things you can start sort of getting used to with the D minder app, but really you are good up until that 
time. And really, if you need to get vitamin D in the afternoon, I mean, go for it. And then also anything I'm saying, I mean, you could also just, and also when I'm tanning my face, it's definitely not out as long as the rest of my body. Okay. So usually I'm giving my face like, you know, 15, 20 minutes and then I'll hat or like whatever, get my, you know, and then take my head out. It's also like just, you know, your head literally gets hot and stuff too. Mm -hmm. So it's good, you know, then, or literally never tan your face and try everything else. If it's really that fearful for you, but what we're actually seeing, and cause I'm in, I mean, my whole company is about skincare, right? So, you know, obviously very, it's a big topic for me and I'm, you know, my whole life is about understanding wrinkles and, and things like that. But what, where, when I, when I study this, where the wrinkles are coming from, because it kind of takes two to tango. So I think of it as like when we're sunbathing and when we're engaging with the sun, it's a relationship, right? It's like you and the sun. It's not like the sun is just doing things to you. There's an engagement there. So, you know, are you cooking with Pam and Missoula on your body and in your body? Or are you like being engaged with the sun with like coconut, olive oil, like eating those good fats? It seemed when I looked at studies from the, I think it was the Los Angeles Institute of Plastic Surgery. And what they found to be the number one cause of like wrinkles and aging was polyunsaturated fatty acids creating hyperpigmentation and melasma and um, creating about 70% of people that had more than 20% of that in their diets to be looking about a decade older than they were. Wow. And so by polyunsaturated yeah. fatty acids, what we're talking about guys here, th these people call them PUFAs. These are omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, but the, what they're talking about here really is the toxic seed oils it's the damaged um omega sixes and frankly zola canola soy yeah all you know, of the big industry oils exactly and i think that most of us will agree that the healthiest fats are going to be more saturated quite often i mean it doesn't mean you need a ton you don't need buckets of fat but um <laughs> but we do need like like the egg yolk that's not fully cooked, that's not cooked through, um, even ghee, butter, coconut oil that you mentioned earlier, good quality extra virgin olive oil. Um, again, that not that you're using to deep fry, because even those really good oils can get damaged by high heat. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, like I will look at my skin and say, man, like I've got a ton of sun damage. And we talked about this earlier, like, you know, I was a lifeguard, so I was out for full days from morning until night and didn't necessarily use a whole lot of sunscreen. <laughs> but also, Plus you know, chlorine, when we're engaging with chlorine in the sun, there is a recipe for, for sun damage, you know, coca, being in the sun and drinking Coca-Cola. I didn't write that. A recipe for dieting, so. <laughs> I didn't um, <laughs> yeah, then there's like, so there's things we can do uh, let's talk about sunscreen and then things we can do internally as well. And then here's the thing with sunscreen. So we're all applying it and thinking that's what's going to keep us wrinkle free. And that ain't the story here. So whether we're, you know, when we're looking at even um, Cochrane reviews, which is um, a medical board, I believe, a medical something where they look at studies and then they'll pool those studies and then make a study of the studies. Yeah. So they did one where they're looking at 14 sunscreen studies. And um, what they found was that the use of sun created more moles, freckles, and more incidences of uh, skin disease. So that's not so good. And then, oh, one of my favorite doctors is Dr. Bernard Ackerman. He's the founding father of dermatopathology, which is uh, sort of a little more serious than dermatology. It's the study of skin and diseases to just more of an extent than dermatology. And he was just such a huge advocate for engaging with the sun. And he wrote a book, I uh, can't remember totally what it's called, but sun. I didn't catch it. Oh my God. Sun on Mel the, it's about the myth of sun and melanoma, like a whole beautiful book. It's hard to find. Yeah, what's it's, it's well worth it. I, it's just to sun, sun yeah. on his name, not the book. Sun, the oh, his name. Sorry. Thank you. Dr. Bernard Ackerman. Oh, Ackerman. Okay. I'm just going to write yeah. it down and we'll try and dig it up for the show. Notes. Yeah, well, we can link. Yeah, for sure. We can link that. Um, anyway, brilliant, man, brilliant book. I, it's so fascinating. Um, 
I forgot why I was mentioning him. Oh well, yeah, because he goes right into like all the myths surrounding melanoma. And then also we can look at other studies like uh, there was one from the Lancet. It was actually in the 90s and it, it showed that more melanoma occurs, um, you know, the less with the least, like less exposure to sunlight, more exposure to artificial light. Mm -hmm. And that people that spent more time outside, either recreationally or for work, or if they live closer to the equator, there was less um, chance of developing melanoma, which is definitely different than what we hear today. And I also find that fascinating because that study was in the 90s. And that was before we basically, you know, were looking at screens all day. Mm -hmm. So now we're like every job is seems to be related to a computer, right? So. Um, yeah, so it just it doesn't, sun exposure doesn't necessarily equate to disease, but definitely a lack of vitamin D does equate to the development of disease because you're downregulating gene expression there. And then the other fascinating thing is through the use of sunscreens, um, so the Cochrane study showing that they're cr creating more freckles, more moles, more skin imbalances, and how we can now understand that, understanding that sunscreen, that's things like with SPF factors, they, um, what, what's happening is you are not receiving both the ultraviolet uh, partner, like the UVA and UVB together, the sort of ultraviolet partners. When we apply sunscreen, we are then just receiving UVA. Mm -hmm. So UVA isolated on its own without UVB is, can be skin damaging. And then we're not getting the UVB, which is the vitamin D generator. So sunscreens are creating more UVB for skin damage and you're not getting the vitamin D. So there's not much point because you want to be in the sun getting that vitamin D. That's the whole point. Right. Besides the infrared. I think the other point that you make in the book that was really interesting about the disassociation of the UVA and UVB is that you're allowing longer exposure to sun with that, like what I think would, the missing piece here is that melanin is protective and yes. melanin coming up, the sunburn is a warning sign to get the hell out of the sun. So now you're able to exactly more time in the sun and you're damaging different layers of skin. You're damaging the DNA in a different way because it's almost like it's turned off the alarm. And so you've just got, and you're just able to get more exposure to these disassociated UV, the UVA, UVB disassociation, which creates a greater opportunity for damage in a different way, which doesn't even touch on, and I think we should touch on this, the toxic ingredients in sunscreens that actually themselves, although they're not carcinogenic in a lab, when you've exposed them to sun, and this is the thing that kind of blows my mind. <laughs> I mean, I'd read it before, but I read it in your, I was like, are you kidding me? Like there are <laughs> ingredients in sunscreen that are used that are, that the oxybenzene, oxybenzene that become yeah. carcinogenic when it is exposed to sunlight and guys like that alone is that that fact alone i think should be put up on billboards and bus boards and it should be blasted through the universe because stop like all it's crazy poor parents it's been banned oh yeah and they're trying to do the right thing and meanwhile you know i just feel like eventually most chemicals we just find out you know that they're not so good so it's like let's try and live without them yeah. um the oxybenzene is banned in europe but it's like everywhere else pretty much as a main of the real active ingredients in sunscreen it is banned i believe in australia and hawaii now which is great because they want to preserve the coral reefs so not only is the damage happening to our bodies it's effect like and that ingredient um is, the, is that one that really does become carcinogenic when exposed to sunlight. And then there's just a slew of others that you know, affect the liver, affect potential fertility. And um, you, the Hawaii and Australia are seeing how it's making a skeleton of coral reefs. Mm -hmm. We don't want that either. It's bleaching them. It's bleaching them. There's, yeah. a, there's actually a really good resource, you guys. We're going to give you some other um, solutions, obviously. But if you insist on buying commercial sunscreens, there is... <laughs> 
the environmental working group ewg.org does publish every year um, in their skin deep database, a review of the sunscreens and they rank them based on toxic ingredients. I mean, I don't know if their, their, uh, filter would meet your standards, Nadine, but at least I'm sure they do, but at least it, it would, it would kind of parse out some of the worst players. Um, but they, but I mean, I think sunscreen can be really simple and it's not like I want to turn, you know, the information in this episode, like Nadine does make a sunscreen and she does sell it through her website. Sun, yeah, it's on heart. Well, yeah. So sunscreen is just for SPF and yeah. it has to be have chemicals in it. And of course, I'm not using chemicals. So I have a we have a sun oil. I call it a sun harmonizer. Yeah, it can like it's called everybody loves the sunshine and it can extend your time in the sun. But I mean, for that redheaded Irish person, it might just be an extra 10 minutes. Yeah. For you, it could be a whole other hour. Um, and so, but I call it a sun harmonizer. I'm working with pigmented plants and beautiful uh, oils and botanicals that have shown to also, you know, heal from the uh, skin damage from the sun, extend the time in the sun, be that pigment. But there's no botanical that actually has an SPF because that is solely regulated by the FDA for chemicals. But there's sort of like, you know, even olive oil and coconut kind of, we can co-, co correlate that it's like an SPF of a six or an eight. So right. if you just even take olive oil, you do have just that a little, you can extend your time in the sun a little bit more. And then zinc um, That's what is I a sunblock. Yeah. So we don't make a sunscreen. We either have the sun harmonizing tanning oil, or we have this um, meaning that it will help you get a tan, not that it tans you without the sun. And then we have like a sunblock, which zinc works and of course we use a, a you know very clean non-coated non-nanoized zinc and what zinc does is it just deflects the rays so the rays just sort of bounce off you that's what you can use you know if you've got to like surf surf in Maui for a few hours but you know so, but you can't be wearing clothes but then I say other than that like you know look into hats or like cotton shirts that kind of thing yeah. when, when you're done you're sunbathing so you can still enjoy the sun and get that beauty from the the red rays. Yeah, I have a, I have a story about your zinc stick actually. Um, oh, yeah, because um, um, we had we were able to to uh, gift it to all the women who came on our retreat. Oh, in great! March, um, thanks to Living Libations, you guys were a sponsor of the event, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, and a pleasure. I went horseback riding with a bunch of women and women who came on the ride. I don't know what happened, but she basically, she applied the zinc to one arm and she forgot to put it on the other arm. Oops. We were on a horseback ride for three hours um, oh. for, and it was, you know, from 11 till two. And she was amazed that the one arm was untouched. I don't know if it was her arm, or maybe she just missed a bunch of spots. But basically, she just had these crazy burns wherever mm. she to apply the zinc. So it was pretty amazing to see. Like you don't expect, you, you never know, right? I mean, in the days when I did, well, yeah, you, you think you need chemicals, right, to have things work. Sometimes there's that feeling. It was pretty, you need an actual sunscreen. Yeah, so it was pretty remarkable how effective that block is. Um, and also how light it is when you apply it. A lot of zincs, you put them on and you look like a ghost. <laughs> so it's, yeah, we really worked on that. So it could be, yeah, as non-whitening as possible. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's talk, because in your book, you also talk about some of the oils. And I, you know, we were trying to think earlier, I said there was a peptide I'd come across that would, mm. that reduced yes. carcinoma. Like I remember it was melanoma. But there's a couple of essential oils that have been shown in studies to reduce. And I mean, guys, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying if you have one of these things, you should just slather on the oil. But was it frankincense or there was? I think, yeah, sandalwood, frankincense and geranium have all showed to be, you know, be able to kind of bring back balance to, to areas where the cells sort of might have gotten out of control in a skin level. I mean. You know, like there are like studies for sandalwood and skin cancer that are very promising. Same yeah. geranium. We have all of that and everybody loves the sunshine. Plus beautiful pigmented oils like sea buckthorn and calendula 
which also, you know, work with that melanocyte layer. There's also, I write about in the book, like we have an internal SPF as well. Yes. So there are, you know, studies that show that foods that help. Um, so obviously that the pigmented foods, like the red algae is beautiful. And then one of my favorite things, one of your favorite things is the primidine spermidine. Yeah. And uh, because that, I mean, I would, I, I will at some point, but I'll talk to Leslie, but I really want to go into the studies that talk about how it really works with um, healing the melanocyte layer, because I find that fascinating because that's where the melanin happens. That's where, you know, with the dysbiosis, uh, melanoma is in that melano is in that melanocyte layer. Yeah. So it's all connected. And then interestingly too, we've got melatonin, which actually helps uh, prevent sunburns. And then there's also even melanotan, which is a peptide yeah. um, that actually, you know, makes you have a tan. So there's all these really neat things that can also work that we can use to help tanning. So I think, you know, and then there's the new primidine that's also made out of the chlorella, the gluten-free one. So you've got that beautiful pigment of the green, which is great. Even drinking water with chlorella, I mean, uh, with like a drop of chlorophyll in it while you're in the sun is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, getting green while you're in the sun is, is really good. And then, um, well, yeah, so it was really cool. I found because I started taking the primidine spermidine last February, just when I started to get back into the sunshine. And um, besides all, it's just amazing on so many levels, but I was really fascinated with how it also made my skin smoother, which I didn't know was possible because, you know, I've been doused in living libations for about 30 years. So <laughs> I got, I do have smooth skin, <laughs> but it got smoother. But then I found, um, Again, I didn't, you know, was never an issue, but I definitely had just more freckling on my chest from those tan tanning days in my teens with like baby oil and tin foil, <laughs> and uh, you know, getting burnt a few times with blisters. But what was really neat is like as I'm, you know, tanning through the spring, the uh, the freckles on my chest are like fading and fading. So I just got to sort of feel and see firsthand how the spermidine really seems to just to balance something deep within the melanocyte layer. Well, Have you found anything like that? Well, it protects DNA, right? Like if we look yeah. at yeah, if we look at its mechanisms of actions, it's protective to DNA, and it, I think it helps to repair DNA. It also um, helps to um, it protects proteins for, in, in terms of it. It helps to what does it do? It addresses misfolded proteins. Uh, yes. Right. And it also upregulates my mitophagy and autophagy. And autophagy, of course, is the mechanism by which your body is going to get rid of damaged. Pro I call that the Pac Man. Pac Man. Yeah. Pac -Man. Pac -Man. Yeah. Pac -Man. Yeah. Little Pac Man. <laughs> so it's got yeah. so many different mechanisms of action, I think, that are helpful. Um, yeah. It, it's in, at a at a cellular and at a gene level, like an epigenetic level. I think that. It can only help. And I'm with you. Yeah. Like, with spermidine, I guess now it was December of 2020, maybe when I first interviewed yeah. Nadine, uh, not Nadine, yeah. Leslie. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. Yeah, no, me too. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me, like all the reviews, all the inform, all the feedback we get back from people who are getting such great results, whether it's their sleep or their skin or their hair. And then like we talk about, it's all the under the hood stuff that's going on that we don't necessarily notice, but maybe, you know, noticing that the skin damage, I mean, for me, I think I have so much skin damage from so many years and, you know, they talk about the skin damage that comes up for you in your fifties, you didn't do in your forties or your thirties, like this is from your twenties. Right. So, and I didn't really actively start doing anything to repair it until maybe the last few years. So maybe in a few more years, I'll have more to report. But uh, I think most for the most part. Yeah, and since I've really done into like just really understanding like being in the sun and sunbathing, which has been in the last, you know, 15 years and then even, you know, getting more serious, I feel like each year and now it's just such a non-negotiable. I've got to say like nothing sun damaging has happened to my skin. I feel like it was the previous stuff that, you know what I mean, that did things and I feel like you know, I'm actually undoing things, you know, from my childhood. 
So I don't know if that helps people just feel a little more relaxed about being in the sun because there's a deeper balance that's going on. Um, I was just wanted to mention on a side note, yeah, because there's a deep under the hood stuff happening with the primidine spermidine, but, and the side effects, so to speak, are just so awesome. Like the good skin, shiny hair. And uh, just, I just take a moment to say like, my lashes have doubled, which I know we've talked about before, but just sort of one of the other benefits of it. It's super fun. Um, I thought we could also talk about melanotan. Yes. Which isn't something to talk about too much, but I know that, you know, uh, your audience would be ripe for this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe you want to describe the peptide first. Sure. So, and, yeah. Yeah, so melanotan is an alpha MSH peptide. And one of the things that it does, it does a lot of different things, but it's real claim to fame. It's called by many people, the Barbie doll peptide. And that is because <laughs> it's been used by Bar by Barbies, <laughs> by, Barbie. <laughs> by Malibu Barbie herself. <laughs> you could use it to 10 competitions. So what it, one of the, one of the, the things that it does is it upregulates the expression of melanin in your skin so that it basically gives you, makes you look like you're tanned because you are. Um, it can work when you're outside of the sun over time. But what I found is tiny amounts of melanoma, of, of melanotan. And if, if I go to the sun for 10 minutes, boom, like it, it accelerates my tan by a thousand fold. It's, it's quite crazy. Um, but, but it has, this, don't forget that melanin is protective to your skin. So it does offer, it doesn't mean you get to lay out forever and, and not have consequences, but it does offer a level of protection to sun exposure. It also helps to thicken the skin. So it reduces the appearance of wrinkles and is more protective as well. Now, yes. we won't talk about all the other things that melanotan does because there's libido, <laughs> there's even libido, yeah. appetite, um, it increases energy a little bit, like your resting metabolic rate. So it can help with a little bit of fat loss. Um, but from, for our purposes, the melanotan to, um, for the sun, and you don't need very much. I think it's a really interesting strategy to layer in with all of these other things that we're talking about here. Yes. And what, I think the one drawback that kind of makes it less than perfect for yeah. The skin tone is that it will darken any freckle or mole you have. Yep. And that's sort of the like, oh, the trade off. However, I think I found, I definitely don't inject it. And what I found is, and it does help too. Yeah. So if you do it before you sun or the time you're going to do it, kind of have, you know, a sun moment uh, in your future that day. But I found what I do is, I, I, I mean, I'd love to use it for all of its healing properties, but I dilute it um, double to what you would do for an injection. And then and I use the sodium chloride to reconstitute it. And then I put it in a nose, yes. a, a nose spray bottle. And what is that called? Nasal spray bottle. And it's also, it's already like more diluted. It's in the bottle. And I literally just have, you know, a little squirt up each nose it like the beginning of the season and then that's it maybe till like October, November, maybe once in the summer. So yeah. um, I'm obviously not really getting benefits of, of using it regularly, but I find uh, the nose spray mm -hmm. in that way, I don't feel like a, anything darkens like any other freckles and stuff. So I feel, and it's really neat because it's like the most even hand you could ever possibly, you know, have because it just you get just glowing everywhere so i just find that very conservative use of it is very handy kind of gets the season going um and then you're not having to deal with the darker darker spots that's kind of you know and i also find that when i used to use it subcutaneously so by injection i'm one of those people like i would get a stain at the injection site um oh, wow a little while to figure out because i thought <laughs> was a bruise I thought I was being clumsy with the needle or something and it took me I had three stains on my belly before I figured it out <laughs> I went digging into the literature and read about this thing and so the intranasal application really obviously gets rid of that for those people that that might happen for the one I think the one warning you know the one little flag we have to give about melanotan is that and we're, we're talking about melanotan too here is that there's 
you know, the, in the literature, you will find there are a few incidences where they believe that in people who had previously had melanoma, that somehow using the melanotan brought the melanoma up somehow or caused the expression of melanoma um, on their skin, in their bodies. So it's not that it caused it, but the only place they really saw this is in people who had pre existing melanomas. So if you have a history, of melanomas, then this probably isn't a great strategy for you until we know more, you know? I mean, is it possible that by activating the melanocytes, the, it brought up this the damaged ones more quickly and maybe they would have brewed under the surface for longer? I don't know, and nobody really knows the answer to that. So I just think that's a caveat that before everybody runs out and goes shopping for melanoma too, um, you just need to keep that in mind. But I love it as an intranasal spray myself. And it actually has really good um, effects for people who have any kind of brain inflammation. It's very effective mm. chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Like it has all these crazy other benefits, like as an antimicrobial, anti inflammatory. Like it's, it is, again, like all it on it's, it's very broad ranging in its effects. But for today's purposes, it can just help us. Um, get that color and a bit more protection for the skin, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's better than, you know, whatever people are using for bodybuilding. Oh, I guess that's a spray tan, right? Yeah, which is talking probably yeah. toxins and Oh, yeah, it is. It's so funny. Like, no, I won't go into the sun, but we'll spray tan, which is just aging the skin, like, you know. And your liver. And, and underneath the hood, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so you had mentioned earlier some foods, and I know in the book you talk about, was it tomatoes and watermelons that are- Yeah, like color, yeah, colorful food. And I feel like there's even more potent colorful food, like with the red algae and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and sea buckthorn even, right? I love they're not going to have sea buckthorn in a study like that. No, but that's sea but, um Nadine has sea buckthorn trees on her property, and- Last time I was there, I was doing my best imitation of a deer. I said, <laughs> That's right. Eating right from the branch. <laughs> into your fingers because they burst. So you kind of have to eat them right off the tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sometimes we eat them like frozen in the winter, the ones that are still like hanging on the branch. <laughs> oh, yeah. That would be amazing. Kind of like ice wine, only better. Um, yeah. Yeah. So sea buckthorn oil, all of these different oils. What did we, did we leave anything out, Nadine? I feel like we covered a lot of ground here. So I guess um, if we could get around to the idea that the sun is not the enemy, and if we respect the sun and build a, an appropriate relationship over time, just like you would with another person, you don't just jump into bed. No. <laughs> you know? We don't want to get burnt by the sun, but no. it's definitely there for us. And we can't, we don't want to block it out of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. You got to live with it and learning to live with it responsibly, I think is just, it's just so important. And, um, and, and it's fun and it feels good. So let's like bring that back in. You know, we don't want to deny the things that bring us vitality and life force. Agreed. Agreed. And you're stronger. And also you wrote in the book that also about muscle tone improves with the sun. Yeah. Which is what a great way to work out by lying in the sun. <laughs> That's my kind of workout. <laughs> if you like, no, I don't need to go to the gym. I'm just going to go hang out in the sun. <laughs> it's not exactly the yeah. same, but it's not the same. But re well, red light too improves um, density and muscle mass as well. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Eventually. Yeah. Well, red light because of mitochondrial activation, right? So it's going, so the mm -hmm. powerhouses. Um, um, making our getting age. the food they need yeah because there's like literally so much of body that's literally functioning on light information on the information from light light as a nutrient got and it it's just biology that's, it's just science people it's just, yeah, it's just science <laughs> okay well maybe um if we haven't left anything out why don't we tell people where to find you and what 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 else would we like to share with them? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm over. We can find you can find us over at livinglibations.com, and uh, we've got my books there. Also, books are they're like wherever books are sold, like Amazon and all that, and they're both Audible versions as well. 
and on Insta, it's Living Libations Official and the Dean Artemis Official. We also have articles on our website, you know, that will give you some primers on like interacting wisely with the sun in case we've missed anything out here or you want to reread it. And the D-Minder app, you know, just get that on Apple. <laughs> it's yeah. a really fun app. Yeah, get it on your phone for sure. Um, and guys, Nadine, the Living Libations newsletter is, it's a gold mine. Like every time I get this newsletter, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, it's so full of amazing information. It's not, you know, it's just, I think your blog and your newsletter are just incredible sources of information. So thank you for oh, thank you. all the work that you've done. So, um, so yeah, so Nadine, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, my pleasure. So good. Looking forward to maybe hanging out in the sun together, not too distant. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Let's do it.